this people we can accept love you know and and marriage and in a way that i think it, it it could be partly about that that that's part of the reason that that has become an argument that can be made more easily well and i feel like there's something inherently attractive to the sort of social conservative about a movement that is seeking to elevate the ideal of marriage right like there's something appealing about a movement that's saying hey look we want people to be monogamous and get married and have children you know there's something appealing in that argument so i think that that has been one of the places where people of different political orientations can can come together is in this one point because it's got something that's very appealing to traditional social conservatives and that the emphasis on the home and on the family and i think related to that that's sort of a, a a positive attraction to the issue on the sort of flip side of that coin i think it also has to do with the fundamental pun intended anxiety in a lot of the religious right which is we're losing or going to lose control of either our own tradition, but more importantly, for especially for this political moment, we're going to lose our seat as the moral authority of what American society looks like. If somebody else gets to decide what marriage looks like, that's, you know, the one of the several things that is at a very deep level, a defining aspect of what a society looks like and right now you know they feel like they get to hold they have have held the cards and say you know boom it's a man and a woman adam and eve we have a sign uh it's very it's very easy to hold up uh and if all of a sudden people say well you know actually this kind of marriage works too and my marriage is as valid as that and we don't really need your religious authority thank you anyway the Thing that people keep saying about uh, a lot of things at this moment, which is, you know, when you're used to having ultimate authority, any loss of your privilege feels like oppression. And I think that anxiety kicks up when all of a sudden they're saying, wait a minute, we don't get to be the ones who say whose marriage is real and whose marriage isn't real. Our mm -hmm. religious values aren't de facto the moral values of the society. Mm -hmm. I have to fight back against that because we're losing ground and we're losing our privileged seat at the table. So I know that Scott had brought up pro-life position. So I'm going to ask about abortion. Prepare yourself. Um, one <laughs> issue that I always hear about from people who are more right-leaning Christians is how can I vote for candidates who don't seek to outlaw abortion? I know a lot of people talk to me during the 2016 campaign, and I would explain why I was supporting and voting for the Democratic candidate and how that aligned with my beliefs. And then they would say, but I just can't, I can't agree with you because I can't vote for somebody who doesn't want to outlaw abortion. So how do each of you view the issue of abortion and what role does it play in your overall political and spiritual worldview? This is going to sound, maybe sound like a terrible snob, I'm afraid. But I think the answer to that depends on whom you ask. I believe there are a lot of leaders the so-called Christian right, who couldn't care less about actually reducing abortions. It's purely a wedge issue for them. Because the fact is, you can reduce more abortions by making comprehensive sex ed available, by making contraception available, by making child care and uh, early childhood development help available than you can by outlawing abortion. Um, so I believe if you talk to the leadership, that a lot of it is disingenuous. Um, and uh, it's not honest at all. I believe if you talk to a lot of rank and file conservative Christians, that's above their pay grade. They don't get that. All they hear is that mm -hmm. you're going to leave abortion legal. That's wrong. The, 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 it's, 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 it's less an issue of trying to have there be fewer abortions than it is being on the right side of the issue morally. Be able to say this is illegal because it's wrong and I don't care about anything else. I also tend to sort of bracket it for a couple of reasons. First of all, at some point in my personal development, I sort of accepted the notion that I'm never going to have to get an abortion, so I'm not going to invest heavily in uh, in trying to affect abortion policy. It, at the same time, I'm 
going to stand up for the rights of my friends to do what they want with their own bodies. But that all so that's some of the bracketing. But the pertinent to this conversation is some of the historical reading I had to do in school about the rise of the Christian right. And I think Scott is exactly right that this has been embraced as a wedge issue. It has been uh, embraced as an issue to gin up energy for people to sort of coalesce around uh, around something that will uh, galvanize them and get them to the polls and get them to church and get them to energize around this us versus them mentality. And you can look at historical evidence for that, where I think it, as recently as the 1978 Southern Baptist Convention declined to include opposition to abortion as a plank in their platform, largely because mm -hmm. at that time it was still a Catholic issue and they didn't want to be seen as too in line with Catholics. So mm -hmm. we're only a generation or two removed from a lot of the same congregations and communities who now see this as their all-defining issue, uh, having given it a second seat to being not too Catholic. And because of that, and truly because of Part A, uh, where you know, at, as a man, I'm very content to be in the passenger seat on the issue of abortion, I, I generally bracket it and try to not let it pull me into the kinds of destructive converse that I might otherwise get into with my more conservative Christian friends and neighbors. So Sophie, as the female Christian left person in the conversation, <laughs> how do <laughs> how do you respond to this question? So generally, the tack that I take, I am pro-choice. I am here because of of an abortion that my grandmother had. So I, I sort of owe my life to abortion in some sort of weird way. But I always have this come up with friends, some of whom are more religious than others, but all of whom consider themselves Christian, who will always say, how can you vote for someone who supports abortion rights? And first of all, I, I usually talk about what both Scott and Ryan have talked about, about how um, the best way to decrease the number of abortions is actually not to make abortion illegal, but to provide contraception to women, to provide affordable health care to women, to provide things like paid family leave. Those are the sorts of things that help people be able to not get pregnant in the first place or to continue the pregnancy if that's what they choose. But then beyond that, one thing that I that is sort of the core of my beliefs around abortion is that it doesn't actually matter whether a fetus is a life because you can't force somebody to give up their body to save another person's life. If my sister needed a kidney and I was a match and she was going to die without that kidney, I have the right to say no to the kidney transplant and nobody can hold me down and make me give my kidney to my sister, even if she's going to die. So you can't make women give up their bodies, even if a fetus is a person, in order to save that person. So that's that's sort of the core of my abortion beliefs. Yeah, I think it's it's a tricky thing. You know, I don't think we're going to get a lot of people who are in the sort of quote-unquote religious right to start voting for Democrats, even if they changed their view on abortion. You know, I... I it's just being used as a wedge issue. But I do think it's a sticking point still for a lot of Catholic voters. And, you know, it, it's something that a lot of the, the Catholics in my family are still struggling with. I think they're, for the most part, they are voting for Democrats because on every other issue, they align very well with Democrats. But they're still having trouble sort of reconciling the abortion question. And so I think the kinds of ways that you're talking about it, Sophie, are are important for people to be hearing and to be thinking about. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how much your second argument would hold water with the kinds of voters that I'm thinking of, but certainly all these ideas about, you know, here are all the other things that Democrats stand for that are going to help reduce abortions. I mean, that's, I think, extremely important. And it's something that I don't think Democrats have been saying enough to appeal to the segment of Christian voters who are more or less on the Christian left, except for this issue. I remember when I was in graduate school, I must have been 24. I used to walk past an Episcopal church on my way to campus. And the church was across the street from a public high school. And the church ran a free daycare center in its basement. 
so that students who had babies could drop off their babies and finish high school, which to me is the way to keep abortions low. But I remember one day I was walking past the church and there were a bunch of people picketing the church, handing out flyers saying, Trinity Church supports unwed motherhood. And the, wow. It's, it's reasons like that to make me think that it's really, it's not about getting rid of abortion. It's about being on the right moral side of the issue. Or whatever the outcomes are, the point is to be right. So I think it's going to be very difficult, as you say, to make any headway with straight, hardline pro-life voters with any kind of, not only a uh, sister needs a kidney argument, but really any argument based on reducing the number of abortions as opposed to being on the right side of the issue morally. So I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but I know some people in my life have asked me, how can I have political beliefs that sort of are based on my religious beliefs? Don't I believe that, that your political beliefs should be completely separate from my religious beliefs? How would you respond to people that think that? So, yeah, I'm thinking back to grad school readings and, and not wanting to go there because I'll, I'll, I'll butcher them and <laughs> embarrass my school and my <laughs> colleagues. But, uh, but, but I, I do believe in the filtering that can happen at between the core of one's beliefs and then the beliefs themselves that that moral core forms and then the public action that those beliefs take in the form of demonstration and voting and so forth, that even if when my hand takes a pen and takes it to a ballot and I vote for a candidate, because they align with a whole bunch of beliefs that are informed by core convictions that have their roots in my religious faith, just because that carries through all those levels doesn't mean that it's not, that everything in between doesn't also exist and and not and might not otherwise exist. You know, if I believe uh, if I believe that no one should go hungry or that to pick something more current and polemical, if I believe that there is such thing as too much wealth and that belief comes from you know you can find a whole bunch of Christian scripture that sort of says wealth is not a good thing. I also believe it can believe it from another angle, and my and my friends who are also going to the polls can believe it from a completely other angle that says it's not good for society, it's not sustainable for society, it's going to lead to societal collapse, and in the meantime, it's going to lead to suffering. So I think that it's not what a lot of people think it is, which is some separation of church and state issue. I mean, it's not about, I don't want people to be in office because they hold my beliefs. I want people to be in office because the positions they hold and the actions they will take align with the beliefs that are also informed my, by my religious faith. And I know I have multiple friends and relatives for whom that would sound like a bunch of mumbo jumbo trying to make it not, you know, <laughs> put all these weird little pathways together to make it not a conflict. But I truly believe that it's not because of all of the different valences from which one's beliefs and public actions can come. Yeah, so I'm not religious, but I was raised in a religious faith, and there is no such thing as a truly objective viewpoint that a person has, right? I mean, everything mm -hmm. that I believe came from somewhere, and a lot of it came from the religion in which I was raised. And the fact that I am no longer religious doesn't change the fact that my views come from somewhere. And so I think it would be impossible for anyone to separate out their religious beliefs from their political beliefs any more than it would be possible for you to separate out your political beliefs from the way you were raised, from the, the place that you lived in, from the political beliefs that your parents had. I mean, all of these things inform what you believe about politics and how politics should be done. You know, in my mind, I believe that what I believe is just objectively right, but of course that that's... <laughs> not the case, right? I mean, there it, it's something subjective. It's something that comes from somewhere. So, you know, I, I think it's one thing to say that, you know, a religious leader shouldn't tell somebody how to vote. I mean, that maybe is a line that we can say shouldn't be crossed. But to say you can't use your religious beliefs to inform your political beliefs makes no sense. And that, of course, is so... objectively true, what I just said. <laughs> Obviously. I knew that. So one thing that comes up a lot uh, with my husband and his other friends who are 
ministers in the Episcopal Church especially, is that religion has seen a pretty rapid decline in membership over 